Now do you begin to see the reason that we're having such a problem in the courts is that for many, many years nobody has ever challenged a thing like this. And so remember what we saw over here in Boyd. Here's what happens in your courts. And the Supreme Court is the one that tipped us off to this in 1885 in the Boyd case when they said, but illegitimate and unconstitutional practices get their first footing in that way, namely by silent approaches and slight deviations from the legal modes of procedure. Now, in these men's time, in this Supreme Court's time back in the 1880s, if a man walked in and wanted the jury to try the law as well as the fact, they would have referred to Georgia versus Brailsford, and there never would have been any question about walking in. Now, gentlemen, it's the duty of the court to tell you what the law is, but it's the sole prerogative of the jury to determine the law as well as the facts. Today, these silent approaches and these slight deviations have precluded our juries today from listening to the law. They cannot decide the law. This can only be obviated by adhering to the rule that constitutional provisions for the security of person and property should be liberally construed. All right? Now you have it from your Supreme Court. I didn't say that. I'm just telling you that I want to send this along to you, this motion lining here, and let you see some tyranny in the making. There's a young fellow who wants to preclude you from arguing counsel, from arguing the Constitution or the jurisdiction. He doesn't want the jury to hear, it, to hear it, and I'll bet you he doesn't want the court to hear it either. He wants that precluded from everybody's hearing. You can't put on your theory of the case. All we want the jury and the court to hear is what I've got to say, and Gordon can just sit there and shut his mouth, and we'll find him guilty and throw him in jail. And that's the kind of process that we're witnessing. That, ladies and gentlemen, is sheer tyranny. And that kind of sheer tyranny needs to be addressed, and addressed in your county. And it doesn't take hundreds and thousands in the courts. It just takes 20 or 30 people in the county to go into those courts and make demands for their rights. All right, the next item that I want to take up then is going to be the subject matter of counsel, or excuse me, the jury. Let's talk about juries and what your responsibility as a juror is. Turn to uh, motion number 26, the notice and demand for Venerim into number 12. It's toward the, uh, well, I guess it's in about the first third of this uh, lesson nine on this case. Called, uh, it's case number 10960, it's lesson nine, number 26. Give you a second here to find that. I want to go through this thing of a jury with you because you know the jury and jury duty is the most important job that we citizens have because that jury is where we put the veto power on our government. The fellow that's probably done the most and the best work on the subject matter of juries is Red Beckman up in Montana. It is my understanding that they've been on television up there a number of times and that uh, they've pretty well got the IRS shut down from 10 or 12 uh, indictments up there a year down to, I think it was zero indictments in 1981 or 82. Uh, I haven't heard uh, much about uh, Red Beckman in the last few months, but I'll say this, that he sure hit the nail on the head and he sure discussed and, and taught and showed and, and uh, covered the issue of juries and what juries are for and how they work in his books. He's written two books now. And uh, if you can dig those books up, I think maybe if you were to look in our uh, catalog, you may be able to order those from us. It's not a part of this course or lesson per se, and I'm not pushing Red Beckman's books by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't mind uh, plugging something that's good and it's certainly worthwhile. And uh, he doesn't push any particular political or religious view one way or the other. He's just a straightforward patriot and a heck of a nice guy. And uh, the information is almost uh, essential in my view, whether you get it from him or get it from someone else. Uh, this issue of the jury, this question of juries and jury power, is crucial to each and every one of us. The juries that we're using today are not struck juries, and they're not juries of your peers. A jury of your peers is a person who has the same status or capacity that you have. If you're claiming the status of a free man, you'd have to be tried by 12 free men. In the state of Idaho, there aren't very many free men, and it could be extremely difficult to find one. In England, it was done like this. A baron would have to be tried by the nobility. He'd have to be tried by those persons who handled or stood or obtained that same class or status as the baron did. A commoner could not be tried by a baron. He had to be tried by another commoner. 
in the United States, <clears throat> free men, which were uh, abundant at the uh, time of the writing of the Constitution, have now dwindled to merchants and traders in equity. Everybody has mortgages. None of us own the land. We're mere serfs on the land. And it's certainly all right for serfs to try other serfs, but it certainly isn't correct or, or uh, proper for serfs to try free men because as soon as a free man walks in and says, I don't want to pay the property tax on my land because I own it free and clear, those people who are paying the taxes come up to this conclusion. Since I have to pay the tax, you have to pay the tax without giving due consideration to the status involved. Why should a man pay tax on something that he's got bought and paid for because he can only rent it from the county if he continually has to pay property tax on it. And I think I covered in the past uh, one of the biggest uh, scams that we've got going in this country. You know, every time that somebody brings up a bond issue, the subject matter is to build a school or it's to build a jail or to build uh, a courthouse or whatever public building you want to build. Well, if you citizens out there want to build it, and there's a million citizens and you need three million dollars to build it. it's three dollars a head why don't you all just put three dollars into the pot and go out and buy the thing for cash and you'd probably get it for two million eight hundred thousand and pay cash but that's never the way it's done because you see the bureaucracy wants to make money in profit and the way they make money in profit is the insurance industry remember is uh, incorporated in the states and the insurance industry has to make profit because they pay taxes now here's the way you're gouged, 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 and then gouged again. They pass a bond issue. Now they've mortgaged your land. Now that your land is mortgaged to the bond issue, you're going to pay the $3 million plus the interest for 30 years, which will probably be $9 million. You could all tax yourselves $3 today. You're going to tax yourself $9 over the next three or four, I mean the next 20 or 30 years. Then the insurance industry on the profits made pay that tax to the government. And in order to make the payments to the insurance company, who pays the taxes to make the payments of that $9 million? Or that, uh, yeah, that $9 million for the school or whatever it's going to be. Now do you see how that scam works? That's becoming or allowing ourselves to become insolvents upon national bank credit. And everybody in the United States is an insolvent. We're insolvent because of HDR 192, but we're also insolvents because every time we have a bond issue election, we run out here and vote ourselves into debt. Now, <clears throat> juries have a way of putting a veto power on anything government does, and that's the purpose of the jury. The reason that we want a grand jury is because we want the people to decide who we're going to prosecute and who we're not going to prosecute. Here in the state of Idaho, we had a case, uh, the state of Idaho versus Claude Dallas, and this fellow Claude Dallas allegedly shot and killed two game wardens, and as I understand it, he claimed self-defense and the uh, state had uh, claimed that it was murder, and they finally the jury found him guilty of manslaughter, I believe it was. I don't believe the man was, uh, was uh, brought before a grand jury. I think he was tried by information. I think he was probably tried illegally and unlawfully, therefore. But he consented to it, didn't he? He didn't raise the objection timely, and failure to object timely is fatal. All right? So now that he's in jail, he's been convicted. He's been tried and convicted without a grand jury, and the jury that tried him is not a jury of his peers because it would appear that he was a free man living off of the land. I don't know whether he had a, a hunting and fishing license. If he did, then he wasn't a free man, but assuming that he was out there living off of the land and he didn't have a hunting or a fishing license, <coughs> he was free in that regard, then <coughs> he was out there living off of God's deer. You see, the deer in this country belong to the sovereigns and the people are the sovereigns. In England, the deer belonged to the queen because she's the sovereign and everyone under that parliamentary system of government and most of the governments of, of the uh, uh, Western European democracies are monarchies that uh, uh, operate with a parliamentary system of government where there's one, one monarch, one sovereign, and uh, uh, therefore uh, everyone in those countries are subjects and members. They don't have the same degree of uh, freedom or the same degree of status that we have here in the United States. And so, as I've said before, here in Idaho, we have a parliamentary system of government and our Republican form of government that protects every sovereign has been subjugated because we, the citizens, do not operate under the Republican form of government, which has to be in the courtrooms. We don't go into the courtrooms to seek redress of grievance. You see, the courts, the, the government itself, 
there's a limit to how many people can go into the courts. I mean, it's obvious that 200 million people uh, can't all go into court on any given day, and that the courts are plugged up and jammed up, as you've probably heard, with, of course, the king's laws, the king's statutes. So the king goes out here and he passes statutes and says it's against the law to blow your nose on the sidewalk. You have to blow your nose into a handkerchief. All right, so you walking down the street and you reach up and you blow your nose, okay? You ever seen a farmer do that? He blows his nose, policeman sees him and he arrests him and he takes him to jail for lewd and lascivious conduct, for, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, being objectionable to the public, decency and morals, etc. And they want to do what? Use the police powers to collect $100 from the guy or $50, urinating in public or open beer containers. All of these Mickey Mouse little statutes over here, which are in reality, what? moral guidelines. I mean, you know, common sense and common decency tells us, you know, that there are certain things that we don't do in public, you know. And I think that that's better taken care of and better educated and better uh, uh, handled in the home. And if it's a common law action, if it's, a, if it's an outrage upon the public decency, then the public can say, okay, that guy's got an open beer container, he's loud and boisterous and he's obnoxious, and so therefore we the people are going to take action against him. And you as a citizen would file a complaint and say, jo George Gordon over there blew his nose in public, urinated in public, or did whatever it was that I did that was lewd and lascivious, and it's a civil action. You take me into court and there's 16 grand jurors over there, you can charge me with a crime if you want to. And let the people decide. That would be the farmers. And they'd sit there. No, here's 16 farmers sitting there. Well, what did George Gordon do? Well, he had a can of beer in his hand and he was drinking it. Oh, well, gosh, uh, what's so bad about that? You know, you get a bunch of farmers over there and maybe they're all over there uh, drinking beer too, you know, on Saturday night. If the people can decide whether or not they want to try you, you won't find nearly so many prosecutions because it requires effort and time and energy. And I think most of us would sit here and say, I just don't have the time, effort, and energy to go sit on a jury. I don't care about George drinking beer in public or blowing his nose in the field or on the sidewalk. It doesn't, it doesn't offend my senses. If it offends yours, bring an action, if you're so serious about it. But what we've done is we've let the legislature up here create a moral code. And the statutes then become that moral code. In order to inflict or enforce that moral code upon us, it requires licensing and contracts and our voluntary consent. And that's what they've done to us. They've grasped and, and uh, taken that voluntary consent from us by licensing us. And that's essentially where we've lost our freedoms. We gave it up voluntarily. Then... Where we're not licensed, they just assume that there is a connecting link and they just prosecute us anyway. And this is especially rampant in this thing of taxes. You see, they don't take you to a grand jury. What they do is they just go put a levy or a lien on your property. That's your check or your house or whatever it is. And compel you to pay the assessments and then go sue them to get it back. And you're always compelled to go into the government's courts. And the government, remember, whether it's judges or prosecutors or executive officers are all eating off of the public trough, aren't they? And they all want to get to the low end of the public trough so that they can get the most slop. All right, now, let's take a look then here at this notice of demand for veneryment number 12. I want to run through this and cover it because it's so important. And it's a vital motion that needs to be put into every motion. And just before I begin this, let me <clears throat> show you here, and let me comment on this uh, motion in Lyman You'll notice that they don't like that, do they? What we need is dozens of people to go into the court and demand our rights. It occurs so often now around this local area that they're beginning to get nervous. I notice that I, our public officials are beginning to take us more seriously. A year ago, they used to laugh at us and hoot and deride and, and uh, make fun of. And this is what uh, all fools have to do, you know, when they're faced with uh, a choice of logic, reason, and common sense or ridicule. Uh, if they can't answer you, if they don't understand your position, and they don't know what to do next, then they ridicule. Oh, you're fat. Well, so what? The issue isn't my weight. The issue is my right to a jury. Well, you're, you're crazy. Maybe I am, but even an insane person has a right to due process of law and equal protection of the law. 
Are you going to put me in Blackfoot without even so much as a hearing, without so much as taking me before my fellow citizens to find out whether or not I am crazy or whether or not I am right on my position? And if I am right, why would you want to put me in Blackfoot? You see, reason, logic, and common sense when you're talking to a judge or a prosecutor will shoot them down nearly every time. You know, even a judge or a prosecutor, when he's compelled to listen to reason, logic, and common sense, the words that proceed out of your mouth are like a two-edged sword. They'll cut him to the quick. He may not want to admit the truth, but you know the truth is the truth and it doesn't change. Now, when I bring up the subject of the grand jury, I'm not sitting here telling you this is the doctrine according to George Gordon. I'm simply telling you that Idaho Code 1911-01 prescribes the grand jury. I'm telling you that our state constitution, at Article 1, Section 8, prescribes the grand jury. Judge, prosecutors, why don't you people obey the law? Why do you sit there laughing and making fun at me and then filing this kind of ridiculous, tyrannical paper against me and trying to do away with the law. It would be a crime if they did away with this law. That would be usurping powers that government doesn't have, which is prohibited. However, when the law is plain and it's there, why don't you judges and prosecutors obey the law? Why don't you try being law-abiding? And what do they do? They point the finger at us, the citizens, and say, well, you're a criminal. Why, look at all the times you've been arrested and taken before judges. Let me tell you, some of the best company in all of history has been arrested and taken before judges, not the least of which are people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Paul and Peter. And Jesus Christ himself, if he were here in Ada County, Idaho today, couldn't carry a weapon because he's been convicted of a felony, which was high treason. Yeah, I'm in good company, and I don't have to hang my head in shame and say, oh gosh, you know, I've been arrested and I've, I've got my picture over here in the Ada County Jail. That's what tyrants have done from time immemorial. And in the Soviet Union, what do they do? They arrest people, put them in an insane asylum, and brand them by innuendo. They say, oh, that guy's crazy. Anybody who brings up rights in the United States is faced with the same problem. Right now in Pocatello, Idaho, there's a man on the 19th of May, 1983, as I'm making this tape today, is faced with a show cause hearing to determine whether or not he's competent. That's right, and that's in Idaho, and that's in 1983. I'm not talking about Russia or China or Czechoslovakia. I'm saying that there's a man in Pocatello, Idaho, who wants his rights and went into a courtroom and laid out his defense and his theory of the case and said, I'm demanding all of my rights at all times, and the judge has actually got the kind of nerve that this fellow's got right here to bring him up to show cause as to why he shouldn't be put in an insane asylum. We're facing that right now. And you know, if we, if we get just a few people in each county who are willing to go across the river and face those Anakims, you know, you've got to make up your mind. Did you want to get out of Egypt or not? If you don't want to get out of Egypt, then shut your mouth, go over there, gather straw, and make bricks for your masters. But if you want to be free, then you're going to have to cut the umbilical cord and cross the Red Sea and go out in the desert and eat manna and struggle with the rest of it. And I might just make this comment, too. If you don't have that kind of dedication, that kind of fortitude, if you're not prepared to go to jail tomorrow morning, then get the hell out of this. You don't belong in here. It's too tough for you. It requires dedication. It requires concentration. It requires some ability. You know, it requires a man that's willing to make a commitment and then go forward on it. Once you've made your decision and you're going to spoil the, the Egyptians, and you're going to cross the Red Sea, then when you get to the Jordan River, there's some riggers over there. That IRS is a big Anakin. Those Gergeshites over there at EPA, and those courtrooms over there that have the mentality of tyrants in there, we've got real tyrants in our courtrooms. We've got lawyers with the same kind of, of tyranny in their minds and their hearts as did the Redcoats and the officials of the of King George's government in 1776 and 1779 and 1783. You know, tyranny isn't something that you find only in Czechoslovakia or Poland or Romania. Tyranny exists everywhere on the face of the earth that tyranny is not challenged and tyranny is not put down. If free men want to live like free men, then free men are going to have to act like free men and free men are going to have to seize and be that belligerent claimant in person and seize their rights by sustained combat. And if you're not prepared for sustained combat, if you're timorous or a spineless jellyfish, 
in one way or another, and you can't handle this, then you should get out of the kitchen, as Harry Truman once said. Now, if you found number 26, let's go through this and let's take a look at what our duties and responsibilities are as jurors. Comes now the free, or the accused rather, a free and natural person appearing specially, not generally, to move the court to acknowledge and respect the fundamental right of this person to enjoy a trial of 12 jurymen as it was constituted and secured by the Constitution of the United States under the common law and in panel the same. First issue, I want a common law jury as it was based upon our Constitution in 1789, and I'm not getting that now, and I want it. If you don't demand it, well, then, of course, you've waived your right to it. There can be no disagreement that during the construction of our Constitution, the framers wrote in the light of their understanding of other and existing uh, prior laws, and indeed the matter is axiomatic. And there's case after case after case concerning the right of struck juries and jury of our peers and the 12-man jury to decide the law as well as the facts. But you know, by silent means and steady encroachment, what has happened? We used to have common law juries, and then they took our common law jury and diluted it until they can no longer try the law, only the facts, which makes the government judge up there, the sovereign, supreme, you people on the jury will decide the facts. We already know he was driving 80, that, no big deal, and I'll decide the law. <clears throat> That's the way tyranny silently and slowly encroaches itself upon us. Then what did they do? Then they came to us and said, gee, these 12-man juries are expensive, let's just dispense with those, and let's have a six-man jury. See how much money you'll save out there, ladies and gentlemen? And then once they got the six-man jury, now they've gone so far as to call these infractions now in the traffic court, and so now they're going to do away with the jury altogether. You started off with a jury, they diluted it, then they diluted it, and now they've diluted it again until now, to where now you don't have a jury. They can still fine you two or three hundred dollars, and now they're saying, well, we can't put you in jail, say. Just give them five more years, and then they'll say, well, you know, these people aren't paying these judgments, and now we've got to put some jail time on it. And unless somebody is willing to stand up and say, this far and no farther, this is the end of it. Well, if people aren't willing to do that, well, then just make brick, gather your straw, and shut your mouth. Intrinsic to the point, however, is the main feature which has escaped the attention of most of our legal writers, to wit, the framers of our constitutions had experiences of or at least were closer to first-hand accounts necessitating and precipitating our great revolution. Therefore, it's historically self-evident that the explicit form and language of our constitutions has chosen carefully, prayerfully, or was rather, chosen carefully, prayerfully, and deliberately. The words in the Constitution aren't random, and somebody wasn't just sitting there mouthing a lot of verbiage when they wrote that Constitution. The accused easily emphasizes, or uh, yeah, emphasizes, with the explicity of language and form set down by our patriotic forefathers because the latest expressions of tyranny and usurpations are no less different than they were 200 years ago. And I contend that the usurpations that we see existing in Ada County, Idaho, are no different than they were in Massachusetts or Virginia in 1775. The only difference being that we have tolerated the tyranny longer than our forefathers. They, they took it for a while, but they weren't... Uh, they weren't disposed or predisposed to sit there for the rest of their lives and live like slaves in Egypt. Among the latest of these tyrannical species are the statutorial provisions for less than a 12-man jury. The accused point should be easily made because the courts are confused as there is still much controversy and confusion surrounding the 12-man jury issue ever since Williams versus Florida. And that Williams versus Florida case is about 1972, and I think you have it in uh, previous literature and books. In the Williams case, the wrong question was asked to the Supreme Court, and therefore the wrong answer was received. Remember those seven rules now, and I'll cover those at the end of this tape. You know, the court is going to rule very strictly and narrowly on every question asked. They're going to answer the question you ask, nothing more. And they're not going to make any further statements into other areas that aren't specifically addressed. The court was asked whether the six-man jury used by Florida was unconstitutional and therefore violated the defendant's rights under the 14th Amendment. The question that should have been asked was, how many persons does it take to impanel a common law jury? And I think Thompson versus uh, Utah would answer the question emphatically. It takes 12. 
Because the wrong question was asked, the decision that was rendered by the high court has led to nothing but confusion because few understand the real question, much less the answer. In the dissenting remarks of Mr. Harlan, we find exactly that the accused has alleged before and shall do again that the courts are enlarging and expanding upon the clear and unambiguous form and language of the constitutions our forefathers labored over for so long. And this expansion, you know, you can take a look at the tax cases and find that the IRS has expanded upon the 16th Amendment tremendously. The High Court has said that income is uh, gain and profits from the source, and so the IRS then turns around and says, well, yeah, that's right, and the source is your paycheck, and so therefore we're going to tax your paycheck, which is the source. And people who are unable to read and write because they go to their government uh, schools don't understand the difference between a tax on the source and a tax from the source. A tax on the gain from the source. And the IRS, I was talking to one the other day, and I said, is it your position that you can tax labor? And he said, well, certainly we can tax labor. You see, the Supreme Court has said time and time again that you can't tax the labor of the man who performed it. You tax the profit from the labor that the man produced. So when I hire a man, and he goes out and works for me, and he makes me a $50 profit, that's income, and I've got to pay tax on the $50 profit. But if I paid you $50 and that's your wages, the $50 isn't profit to you. That's compensation for labor, and that's not taxable. And yet they go right out and tax it. You see how they expand upon the law? And then you don't go to a grand jury to decide whether or not you should tax labor. You never get a chance to go over to a jury of your peers. You get a government jury, you get a government trial. And that's what our founding fathers were complaining about. That's just one of the issues, this thing of the suspension of their jury trials and transporting them far away to England. The only thing they're not doing yet is trying cases far away, and it isn't uh, unheard of. You know, we had a fellow here that was tried on a tax charge, and they tried to take him to Washington, D.C. to try him. So if you think that what was occurring in 1776 is something new and unique, if you think what they're doing in Russia and throwing people into insane asylums is something new and unique. We're, we're beginning to experience that right here in Idaho. And I say it's time to call a halt to it. I say it's time to call these public officials on the carpet and say, hold her there, troops. Let's start asking and answering some real questions here as to law. You know, it may be necessary for a few Christian people out there to go seek out 300 left-handed men and to go forth and to make the corrections necessary as they had to make corrections necessary back in Joshua and Judges. You know, it wasn't unheard of in the history of Israel to go forth in the name of God Almighty himself with 300 left-handed men to straighten out the public officials that needed to be straightened out. When tyranny needs to be corrected, we citizens are not totally devoid of the means necessary with which to make said correction. But I think that it would behoove all of us to make the corrections logically, rationally, and by using common sense and by using the courts and going to our public officials and telling them, all right, troops, this belligerent claimant is here prepared for sustained combat. Now let's sit down and talk about the issues. I'm not going to serve you tyrants and I'm not going to make your bricks for you. Now once we've gotten that straight, now we can get down to the nitty gritty. Now let's talk about your compensation and how far you're going to go, and who you're going to try, and how you're going to try them, and how our government is going to function. I think that the eloquence of our arguments in the courtrooms will readily manifest themselves on the bank balances of our public officials. We just need some people with backbones instead of jelly bones going on. Because the wrong question was asked, the decision that was rendered by the high court has led to nothing but confusion because few understand the real question, much less the answer. Now, if you don't ask the right question, you're going to get the right answer to the wrong question. Now, understand that. That's what happened in Williams. And it's going to happen again and again because, remember now, in Illinois, we have a lawyer back there... <clears throat> who has filed suit and challenged the constitutionality of an ordinance of a city council concerning concealed weapons. And he doesn't have a controversy. He wasn't damaged. 
And if it does go to the Supreme Court, he's going to get the right answer to the wrong question. Because he doesn't have a constitutional right involved. And that's what each and every one of us need to understand. And that's why I'm going to run over those seven rules again. I want you to know and understand those seven rules because it's absolutely imperative that we citizens, when we go into those courts, that we ask the right question on the specific issue and then move that right question to that specific issue up the line to the Supreme Court so that we get the right answer back and we send the right message out here to our lower courts and to our public officials. Down at the bottom of the page, I just wanted to cover that twice. Constitutions are not only documents that declare specific minimal limitations of power to government, but also they're an expression binding governments to the more superior rights of the people. And here's some little twit that comes out of law school. And here you are. We have rights of citizens, and he just says, we want to suspend those rights. We want you to rule that this guy cannot even bring forth his issues before the jury. Let the jury decide whether or not you're a kook. Let the jury listen to the facts. The reason they don't want the jury to hear the facts, hear the law, hear your position is, they might listen to you. You know, if your fellow citizens were to hear your side of the story, they might find you not guilty. Can you imagine the tremendous slap in the face that that is to judges and prosecutors when you take their power away from them? It's humiliating, you know, when you've usurped and taken powers that weren't rightfully yours. And then somebody comes along and says, all right, that's far enough, boy. Sit down. You know, you have to do that with your children once in a while, don't you? I have to do that once in a while with my kids. You know, they get a little boisterous and a little out of line. And somebody has to run over, tap them on the shoulder and said, now we've gone far enough. Sit down. Shut up. And that's the end of the argument. Now you do that to a prosecutor up there, and he wants to throw a temper tantrum like this. I call this a temper tantrum. In Williams, the court stringently, or excuse me, in Williams, the court strangely does an about face. Rather than bind the states by the hitherto undeviating and unquestioned federal practice of 12 member juries, the court holds, based upon a poll of states' practice, that a six man jury satisfies the guarantee of a trial by a jury in a federal criminal system and consequently carries over to the states. This is a constitutional renvoyi, Baldwin versus New York, 1979. Justice Harlan couldn't have made this person's argument better or more clear, as this is exactly why the accused now has to unnecessarily move the court to honor a common law right hitherto undeviating and unquestioned. So they've just completely ignored our common law. We can have our common law back, but we're going to have to do it with sustained combat, and we're going to have to go into those courts, and we're going to have to demand it. And just because the guy tells me no once doesn't mean I'm going to let up. I'll be in this fight until I get my common law jury back. Now, I don't know whether I'm going to die first, but if I die, then there'll be somebody right behind me to continue on. In other words, we will keep with it until our public officials listen to our position. That's the way that has to work. Sustained combat. The courts are stumbling into areas which they have little understanding. Their confusion is unfortunately the order of the day. They were never properly delegated the power to pass over the quality of the fundamental and basic rights that the, the people reserve to themselves. The government, jealous of its powers, has slowly and stealthily crept in upon the, among the people, or upon the people, until now we the people, we have to find it necessary to forcibly remove such powers in order to preserve and maintain as inviolate the inherent and inalienable right of the people. We're going to have to dislodge this camel from our tent. And if <clears throat> the camel is in our tent, I guess what we have to do is to get our nose into the tent. And then we'll get our head into the tent. And then we'll get our nose into the tent until we throw the camel back out into the wind. Because the camel is now occupying our tent. All political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for their equal protection and benefit, and they have the right to alter, reform, or abolish the same whenever they deem it appropriate. Idaho State Constitution, Article 1, Section 2. And resoundingly, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain in, uh, inalienable, that should read, rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. 
laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. That comes from our Declaration of Independence in the second clause. And there's another little section in here where uh, King George, and this has happened to us today over here on page 5, he's erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. So what you have here now is over 50% of the people in the United States of America are now receiving some form of a government check. That means that the other 49% of us, or 48%, then have to pay that 52. So you see what's happened? Now, we call this democracy. And in this democracy, when the majority says, we're going to loot the assets and the property of the minority, they call that the law of the land. I call it BS. Nothing more, nothing less. I have an inalienable right to my property, and I'm not going to have a majority of a 99 out there steal my property from me with, just, by just sitting here and saying, well... The majority of you people, that's 99 of you people, have voted and therefore created statutes and laws and bound them upon me, and now I have to work and serve you. I don't know about you, and I can't speak for you, but I will not serve those tyrants. I used to. There was a time when I employed 30 people, produced a million dollars a year, and paid $200,000 in taxes. Today I produce nothing. I employ no one and I pay no taxes. I will not serve you tyrants. Now, you may have judgments against me and you may impoverish me, but you cannot control me and you cannot make me produce for you. You can kill me and you can lock me up in jail and you can do all kinds of bad, wicked, nasty, evil, rotten and terrible things to me, but you'll all starve to death in the process because one of two things is going to happen. You're going to feed yourselves or you're going to die because I'm not going to feed you. Got that, dummy? Now, once you understand that, then all of us can go out here and we can buy, sell, trade, and produce and we can all be prosperous. But the majority of you are going to have to stop living off of the minority of us because I'm not going to sit by and have my property uh, deprived of me. I'm not going out and work hard and produce and then have you steal it from me. That's ridiculous. And that's exactly what they're doing. And then they call that righteousness, you see. These hypocrites go out there and say, well, that's the law, you see. And, and it's the statute over here. Poppycock. I don't think that the people out there would sit still for the stealing of farmers' farms and houses on bank foreclosures if the people had an opportunity to vote. I notice out here in the Midwest where they're stealing these people's farms and I use the word stealing absolutely within the, uh, the, the context of blatant uh, theft, absolute uh, taking of property and giving absolutely nothing for it. They go out here and give you a loan of Federal Reserve notes and place you in uh, voluntary servitude. They gave you absolutely nothing. They created this garbage out of thin air and then have you out there working on your farms and have you working in your businesses over there producing substance for these thieves and then they pass laws and statutes and compel you to pay them your substance for their worthless paper. Yeah, that's theft, ladies and gentlemen, and that's condemned in Scripture, uh, plain and simple. It's condemned in our constitutions. It's condemned in our common law, and yet it's, it's so rampant in this country there isn't one person in a hundred that can identify a dollar. You go out here and say, got a dollar? No. Yeah, yes, I've got one right here, sir. Uh, and they'll open up their wallet and say, yeah, I've got a dollar here. They haven't even got a demand for a dollar. You haven't even got a chosen action there. This is even a crummy chosen action because at least a chosen action is a right of recovery. you got a paper dollar. You don't even have a real chosen action because it doesn't have any right of recovery for anything. I'll tell you what we need to do now is to start our own system of weights and measures. You know, God said that a man that has faulty weights and measures is a criminal. I agree with that. I think what we need is an honest money system. We have to get back to dealing with one another without stealing from one another. One of the biggest sins, one of the biggest problems we have in our country and the reason that we're being cursed for our uh, the endeavors in our country is that we're robbing everybody. Every time you give them a Federal Reserve note or a check, you're giving them a promise for substance. You're stealing from them. Each and every one of us. I've been stealing from people for years. That was when I was done. <laughs>